My name is Julie Noblet. I'm the Community Manager for the Diagram Center here at Benetech. Thank you for your patience and waiting a couple of minutes while we uh, got the audio established, uh, but we welcome you. I'm delighted to welcome you today to Tools for Creating Accessible Math. Your presenters today are Jeff Fried and Brian Gould of the National Center on Accessible Media at WGBH, and they're joined by Steve Noble, a math and science accessibility researcher. The three of these uh, presenters are really terrific. I think you're in for a treat. We have more than 160 registrants for our webinar today, and so for everyone to have the best audio experience, uh, you've all been placed on mute so you can hear uh, us, but we won't be able to hear you. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, just type them into the chat window that you should see in your ReadyTalk console. Uh, we'll collect your questions and answer them during a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Our session today is 60 minutes. If you need to leave before the end, that's no problem. A recording of this webinar, along with the PowerPoint slides, will be made available on Diagram's training page within a few days, so you can come back and listen to it at your leisure. So we have a lot to cover. With no further ado, let me turn this over to Brian Gould, and we will get started. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Gould from the National Center for Accessible Media, WGBH. Today, I'm going to give you a quick intro to the Diagram Center and go right into what we're going to be talking about today, with it, which is math access and math ML. Uh, Steve is going to guide us through uh, the research and some best practices about speaking math, and Jeff is going to give us some demonstrations of tools for reading and creating math and math ML. So I'll just get right into it. If I can click the right button, there we are. Uh, the Diagram Center is a uh, Department of Ed five-year research and development center focused on making digital images accessible for people with print disabilities. And our um, main objectives, our main deliverables are providing guidelines for image uh, description and other means of making uh, images accessible, uh, to do product evaluations and to create tools and technology to help uh, content creators and uh, digital book makers uh, turn their images into accessible images. Moving right into math, uh, there's lots of avenues that are opening up and widening for accessible math, many more than were available even just a few years ago, both in terms of uh, mainstream ap academic uh, digital texts or uh, websites and also in the assessment space, uh, more and more accessible math is um, both here and on the horizon. There's also um, sort of a push for this. Uh, a year ago, um, DOED through the NIMAS Center made a recommendation that MathML should be used uh, to improve the accessibility of mathematical and scientific content. And just one example of this in the um, uh, marketplace is that uh, a major textbook publisher, Pearson, in their higher ed math and stats textbooks have pledged to make uh, digital copies available that are both formatted in HTML and have uh, MathML uh, formatting for all of their math equations. So that's just to show that there is a, a very major movement toward accessible math and the use of MathML in mainstream uh, text, textbooks and uh, soon uh, assessment. So here's a quick overview of what um, a student might come across as they're reading their math textbook and they come across an equation. And if this is in a digital environment, that might not actually be an equation. It's probably a picture of an equation. That's most likely what it is. It's usually a JPEG or some other sort of uh, image file that's been put in there because it looks good. It may have started off as an actual uh, equation, but it probably is in the textbook or on the web page as an image, which is inaccessible for someone who can't see it or is using a screen reader to try to access it. So the uh, the traditional or the typical way of making that math equation accessible would be to write an alternative text or a short text description of the image. And one way you could do that is to simply write 
z equals 2a plus b squared over c. And that is just fine for some users or some students. For others, uh, it still leaves a lot of ambiguity, especially if you are visually impaired and can't see uh, the equation. Remember, it's an image, so if you're relying solely on a screen reader, uh, two, z equals 2a plus b squared over c uh, could mean several different kinds, several different equations. So if you wanted to make it as unambiguous as possible, you could add some more language. You could write something that sounds like this, c equals 2 times the fraction, open parentheses, a plus b, close parentheses, superscript 2 over c. So there's no ambiguity there, but you've now just made it a little tougher for someone who maybe uh, partially uh, have some vision or may have some other print disability that has nothing to do with vision, and you may have uh, confused the equation a bit by putting in all of these extra words. Steve is going to walk us through uh, the, the research and practice of speaking math, but suffice it to say for my portion of the presentation that there are multiple ways of speaking uh, math, uh, even for the same equation. So one way, and I'm going to say uh, really the best solution for this, is to mark up your math in something in a markup language called MathML, which puts uh, XML code around each uh, element of the equation so that, I'll flip to the next slide, so that from that one bit of MathML, you can have lots of uh, different re ways of rendering the math. It can be done visually so that you get that nice uh, picture of math. It can be uh, rendered in audio in multiple versions. The same MathML can be read out by software in different um, styles. So we can hear that first style, which was sort of a plain English style or an unambiguous style. You can also output it directly to a refreshable Braille display I'm going to click to our next slide, which is a piece of hardware uh, which produces Braille, sort of on the fly, if you will. Or you could even uh, create print Braille right from MathML. And I'll just add that it actually isn't as easy as I just said. There are more steps, of course. Uh, to Just to create the MathML, you'll need a math editor. Um, and then the MathML needs to be put back into the original document or whatever the final document is. Uh, it needs to be put back in the digital textbook, uh, if you will. And then from there, from that digital document, it can be, it can be um, turned into refreshable Braille right to the refreshable Braille display. Of course, you'll need a Braille printer if you're going to print Braille. And then you'll need a reading system uh, or a text-to-speech system or uh, a screen reader, if you will, to actually then translate that MathML into speech. So there's many steps involved, but with by using MathML, you get the widest variety of potential outcomes, and you can satisfy the largest number of students or users um, just by uh, creating that equation one time in MathML. And I will now turn it to Steve to talk about the, the varieties and reasons behind uh, speaking math in, in different ways. Okay, and I'm going to, uh, because I cannot advance these slides uh, for technical reasons, ask someone to go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, so I uh, I do work for a number of different organizations uh, as mathematics and science uh, content specialist at Bridge Multimedia, also as a research consultant uh, with a couple of different research projects, uh, the Metric Project, Mathematic Etex Research Center, and also uh, with ETS, Educational Testing Services, on uh, some of their research projects that are also looking at issues of uh, trying to make math accessible to individuals with disabilities. And uh, I also teach at the University of Louisville and work on research projects uh, through them when we have funding for things. And uh, I have the privilege of serving on the NIMA Standards Board, the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard. So uh, one of the fundamental things about speaking math in a computer uh, or speaking that uh, even uh, a human reader is that uh, one size does not fit all. You, there is not one uh, universal way 
to speak math. That's rather obvious if you start to think about it a little bit. First of all, the, uh, the there's a few different distinctions. One is that the uh, the same symbol uh, may have different meanings uh, and and hence different ways to verbalize that symbol depending on the discipline, the context in which it's provided. Uh, just an example of that, uh, often with uh, very simple symbols like uh, bars. Uh, I mean, there are horizontal bars, there are vertical bars that are commonly used in math. Uh, the common uh, overbar or the bar above, uh, sometimes called an overscore, overline uh, symbol, is uh, commonly has different meanings uh, in mathematics. For instance, if you're working with Roman numerals and you have a a bar above uh, the letter X, you're representing the uh, the number 10,000, for instance. If you have a bar above uh, 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 a, a couple of numbers or even just a single number in a, in a decimal, uh, you're representing a repeating decimal value. Um, if you have a, a line above uh, the letters A, B, for instance, is commonly uh, is uh, signifies a line segment if you're looking at geometry. And then there's other uses for such similar lines in statistics and in set theory that, that would uh, change the meaning of what that bar represents. So obviously there's going to be different ways that you would vocalize that symbol in those contexts. Um, a lot of the research that I have done uh, is the, in, uh, involves the issues of, of individuals with a variety of different types of disabilities and that uh, the nature of that individual's disability may uh, dictate how the math will be spoken. Uh, there are also uh, issues around uh, what language, of course, you're trying to uh, speak. Obviously, if, if you're uh, speaking uh, math in a language other than English, uh, you're going you're gonna to change the words to, to match that language. Um, the great thing, of course, about MathML, as, as Brian had just mentioned, is that if you use MathML uh, as opposed to just using something like static alt text, uh, then the user's technology, the software that the, the user is reading to render the mathematics uh, using synthetic speech can actually on the fly make whatever changes are needed to get the kind of math speech that you need. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so in particular, there are two major populations when it comes to speaking math uh, as far as the print disability community is concerned, uh, blind students, and then students who are sighted but yet have some other type of print disability, for instance, a student with a learning disability like uh, dyslexia or some other uh, type of disability that interferes with their ability to process uh, printed words, uh, both these are, are rather large, uh, the, the two main groups that would be using synthetic speech. There are, of course, other kinds of disabilities where synthetic speech would be useful, but these are the primary areas. Um, so uh, in the case of blind students, you really need more uh, speech that is unambiguous. So it needs to have uh, a, good deal, a good deal of precision about the words that are used, and uh, in many cases you are adding additional words to indicate something important about that expression. For instance, if it's, a, if it's a fraction, you need to know when the fraction begins, when the fraction ends, what's on top of the fraction, what's underneath of the bar line. So those are essential elements that a blind student will need that is not necessarily needed for a student with a learning disabilities. In some case, may actually increase the cognitive load that is carried with those extra words and will make it more difficult for the student with a learning disability to uh, understand. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, one of the easiest examples uh, goes back to uh, some original work we did you know, on Project SMART. So that stood for the supported math accessibility reading tool. That was a study that was done jointly by the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. Uh, I was on the research team for that project, and we were working with middle school students who were studying mathematics. And these students had learning disabilities. They were not blind students. 
And um, one of the very first times in the classroom when we were using synthetic speech, we, we came across uh, an equation, which I include on this slide here, very simple uh, equation for figuring out perimeter. Um, and uh, that was problematic as it was being spoken by synthetic speech at that time because it was reading the equation as cap P equals 2 open cap L plus cap W close. Well, that reading was uh, just represented a huge stumbling block for the sighted students with learning disabilities in that course uh, because it increased the cognitive load to try to understand what they were hearing even though they were also seeing this. I mean, they were using technology. Uh, in this case, it was text help, read and write gold, which was, of course, uh, displaying the math and using dual color highlighting as the math was being spoken. But this additional language, which actually is very useful for a blind student, was causing significant issues uh, for the uh, students with learning disabilities. So in that case, we uh, we changed the speech. We created a uh, alternate speech rule uh, that was then applied in the software. And so anytime uh, an equation like that came up, it would uh, read it differently. In this in this case, we we changed it to where it was read as p equals two parenthesis l plus w in parenthesis. And that was uh, much more easier for students to understand. They were not; they didn't see it as a uh, sort of a stumbling block to understanding. Uh, we could have used uh, other alternate ways of saying that. For instance, we could have said uh, p equals two times the quantity l plus w. That was uh, that was another thing we had considered, but the teachers, uh, you know, sort of voted that that version down. But that, but one thing that's uh, really nifty about MathML is that you can have uh, a number of different verbalizations for math that are set in speech rules, and then you can simply change the speech rule you want to use uh, for that population. And that's the great thing about MathML is you have the ability to do that. Uh, let's go to the next slide, if we could. So um, there are, uh, if you're using synthetic speech for uh, math, what you will probably come across um, uh, are a, a number of, of different speech rules that are in common usage. Uh, I would say the most common speech rule for synthetic speech in math would be what's commonly called simple speech. That is uh, the default speech style that is actually used in Math Player, the plug-in developed by Design Science. And uh, it uh, has been in use for a few years now, and uh, it uh, is what you would commonly hear. Now, in the latest version of Math Player, you can actually modify what is spoken using the simple speech rules by, uh, by target setting, in this case, the, the population. So, for instance, uh, there is a setting for students who have learning disabilities versus students who are blind, and you can actually make that that setting change in uh, in the software itself. So, uh, and actually, our research that we had done in Smart, and then our metric strand uh, research that we did as well, uh, we supplied this information to Design Science, and they did integrate a number of these changes, which we're quite thankful for. Uh, but th that is a, uh, uh, a really very valuable speech rule. Uh, math speak is another speech rule that probably many people on this call have heard of before. It's a, it's a specific speech style which has been developed uh, especially for blind individuals that are used to reading Nemeth Braille code. It was, uh, math speak was actually originally developed by Abraham Nemeth, the same person that developed the Nemeth uh, Braille code for mathematics, and it's uh, is very similar to the way a person who would read them at Braille uh, would then verbalize uh, uh, what they were reading um, from the Braille. So it is uh, uh, so it's very useful for someone that is common to uh, to commonly read uh, Nemeth Braille. There's also ClearSpeak is uh, 
is up and is an up and coming uh, speech rules is being developed by ETS. So I'm involved in the research project that's working uh, on this uh, on these speech rules. This will um, use extensive use of prosody, so using natural pauses and, uh, uh, in some cases, uh, slight changes in, in speech uh, uh, pitch or uh, um, uh, rate uh, rate of sp uh, speed, uh, little subtle changes that help uh, make math more intelligible to the listener. Uh, and also it uses uh, extensive use of what are more familiar kinds of math speech you would find in, uh, in a classroom setting. Um, Let's go to the next slide, if we could. Okay, so, uh, and this is my my uh, last uh, slide here, which uh, I can see I, I need to, I'm about out of time here from on my end, but there's a few other issues I would mention. Uh, uh, the whole issue of instruction versus assessment. So there is a concern, especially for uh this would be of interest to publishers who are working with states that are uh, creating uh, uh, assessments for the uh, for schools. Uh, these these are big assessments that determine uh, important uh, things that the schools need to find out as you know how, how far uh, how well their teaching is, et cetera. And uh, so there is the issue of uh, construct validity. Um, and uh, and so there is a concern there, um, and this shows up a lot in differences that you'll see between uh, reading guidelines uh, that are uh, developed by different states. I included example, for instance, uh, uh, the the square root of eight uh, is is something where uh, if you were using the the uh, the guidelines provided in the state of Georgia, you would actually read that as radical eight. Uh, if you were reading what you would uh, the, the park guidelines, uh, you would read the square root of eight. So, uh, and there are other variations I could talk about if we had more time. But again, this is another rationale for using MathML. With MathML, you don't change the code at all. So you don't change the original source uh, document, the original uh, source, the equation itself. Nothing about it is changed. You don't have to change the uh, alt text, et cetera, uh, the, the MathML will in, allow the software to uh, use the speech rules that you uh, have predetermined in the software that you want to use. So, for instance, if you have a special set of speech rules developed for a specific state for their assessment, then uh, you can simply switch to that, and then everything uh, will change in that document and will be spoken uh, exactly the way you you have it set. Uh, there is issues around navigation. You know how to browse a complex equation. We we don't have uh, real good solutions uh, yet. Uh, there is work being done on that. Uh, multi language support is another issue. Uh, Math Player, for instance, has speech rules uh, now for 15 different languages. So uh, so that's good. Uh, and uh, but anyway, I think uh, I'm basically out of time on my end, so I need to hand it over. I think to Jeff now. Thanks, Steve. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Fried from uh, National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH. I work with Brian Gould, and I will, in fact, be showing you some brief examples of some of the things that Steve and Brian were both talking about. Um, we're going to be looking at ways to uh, read and render MathML and images of math, and also I'll be showing you uh, ways to create MathML. Um, all of this is going to happen very quickly. Um, we have about 20 minutes to go over these demos, and so um, you can type your questions into the chat window, and Brian will keep track of them, and we will answer them um, at the end. But um, we're going to get moving now. Um, <clears throat> Steve and Brian both talked a little bit about um, images of math and their accessibility, um, and that they can be made accessible using, um, in HTML, the alt attribute or a long description mechanism. Um, but the important thing is that if you're going to be supplying images of math, you must at least include alt text, say the alt attribute, that provides um, a text equivalent 
of the math. Um, images that don't have alt text um, are in HTML, for example, are identified by screen readers only by the image name. This is the case if you're dealing with materials uh, in HTML, say web-based uh, reading materials or PDFs. Some other reading devices will also uh, identify images by um, by an image name. Now, I'll show you an example of this. Um, in order to do so, I have to share my desktop, which um, is going to uh, take away the slides, but will show you um, some demos and things that I have running on my computer. I'll be doing some application switching, so you'll be seeing some of that as well. And um, first, let me show you um, what happens when you throw a, an image of math at somebody that has no text equivalent. I'll be using a screen reader. Um, I'll be, this screen reader is called VoiceOver. It comes with um, uh, any OS X device. Um, it comes with all iOS devices as well. They, so in other words, this is a Mac screen reader. But the result is just about the same with any Windows screen reader. So first, let me turn on VoiceOver. VoiceOver on conference controls. And let me get into this. Um, I have this screen reader set to read very slowly. Most people who use screen readers read at a speed four or five times faster than what you hear. Um, in addition, I've uh, turned on some visual controls so you'll be able to see as well as hear. Um, there's a little window on the bottom that will show you what voiceover is speaking, and you'll see a little box on the screen as well. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to zip ahead. New tab, but show HTML. Inter and have voiceover jump right to the equation. And here is what, um, I'll start here. Here is what um, a screen reader will read when it runs into an image without alt. The quadratic formula looks intimidating, but actually is not very complicated. Here is what it looks like. Q-U-A-D-I-M-G dot GIF image. So it read the text, and then it read the image name. Uh, obviously, that's are currently on quiet. Obviously, that's not very useful. So Absolutely. let's look at Absolutely. the quadratic form. Voiceover gets out of control. Let's look at the same page with an image that does have uh, a text equivalent. I'm going to back up. Q U A D I M G. Stop new tab show. There we go. Okay, I'll start reading here. The quadratic formula looks intimidating, but actually is not very complicated. Here is what it looks like. Begin fraction negative b plus or minus start root of quantity b squared minus 4acn root over 2n fraction. Image. Now, that is uh, a description that somebody wrote, a human wrote that. This is, not, this is not generated from MathML. This um, was written by a human and inserted into the code. So that's what the screen reader was reading aloud. Um, let me turn off voiceover. Voiceover off. And I will go back to the slides. Um, so we just talked about what happened uh, when a screen reader encounters, say, an image of math with a text equivalent. Um, some of the things that Steve was talking about in terms of vocabulary can definitely be applied there if you're hand-authoring descriptions. In other words, if you must include images of math as opposed to other approaches like MathML, if you include images of math, then you must include a text equivalent, and you can apply some of the ideas that Steve and Brian were talking about as you're creating the descriptions. But then there's MathML. Um, as Brian said, MathML is a markup language, just like HTML or SVG, any other markup language um, that can be used to present information. And the nice thing about MathML is that can be, it can be uh, transformed into a number of presentation methods. They can be visual, they can be oral, they can be braille, they can be print. Um, the important thing to remember about um, using MathML is that it can be used to provide accessible math to um, people with many types of disabilities. Often when we talk about accessible math, we're instantly thinking about and talking about people who use screen readers. But in fact, there are other audiences. Steve mentioned some of them, um, people with visual impairments who say need to zoom an equation or enlarge an equation to see it more clearly. 
people who want to hear it read aloud as well as see it, and, of course, people who uh, might need Braille. So accessible math means more than just screen readers, but it means screen readers, too. Um, MathML can be displayed in more browsers this year than it could a couple of years ago, which is a good thing. Um, uh, I'll show you some examples of this, but right now um, you can see MathML without any special plugins or add-ons in Safari. You can see it in Firefox on uh, Mac and Windows. Opera, another browser you can use on uh, Mac and Windows. Um, MathML renderings may differ from one uh, browser to the next, so they may look a little different in Safari, an equation, than it does in Firefox or Opera. And not all features of the full MathML specification may be supported in all browsers. MathML is a giant spec, and so there may be things that some browsers support better than others. Um, for the time being, there is no visual display of MathML in Chrome. There was for a little while, and um, Google took it away because I think they felt like there were too many bugs they had to work out. So right now, you can't see any MathML in Chrome um, on Mac or Windows. Uh, what's next? Okay, um, yes? We just had a question. Can, will MathML be displayed in uh, Internet Explorer? Uh, somebody just asked if MathML can be displayed in Internet Explorer, and the answer is yes, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Um, but first, I'm going to go back to my desktop, and I'm just going to show you some very quick examples of MathML. Um, what we have on the screen here is um, Safari showing a math equation, which is right here, which looks very nice. This is MathML. Um, we can look at the same equation in Chrome. Windows. Quiet. Um, that's what MathML looks like in Chrome. We're going to come back to that in just a second. This is what the same equation looks like in Firefox. It looks remarkably the same as in Safari, as you can see. There's Safari, there's Firefox. Let's look at the same equation in Opera, which looks a little bit different. You can see that the radical has kind of a more dramatic shape. There it is in Firefox, and there it is in Opera. Um, it looks different. It's the same thing, though. It's the same code. It's just how the, uh, the browser chooses to render it. And um, obviously, these are all available in Windows as well. Uh, but to save time, I will skip showing you that for now. Now, um, IE. Somebody asked about IE. Yes, you can display MathML in IE with the use of the Math Player plugin, which Steve mentioned. We're going to be taking a closer look at uh, Math Player in just a minute. Um, currently, uh, Math Player works best with IE9. There are some problems with uh, Microsoft and Math Player uh, when you try to use Math Player with IE10. It's not supported right now. So if you want to use Internet Explorer, you need to use 9 and not 10. Um, the nice thing about Math Player is it provides a number of um, rendering options. You can use Math Player to um, basically hold hands with a screen reader and use your screen reader to read the math aloud. Um, math Player will speak math aloud without the use of a screen reader. And like Steve said, you can uh, use Math Player to render um, the MathML in um, different verbosity levels, essentially, or you can use it to render MathML to Braille as well. And let me share my desktop, and you can see that. Let's go to Windows. There's Windows. Okay. Here is um, the same equation. This is the quadratic formula rendered in IE9, and here's the math, MathML, um, rendered using MathPlayer. And if I click on it, Look at that. It zooms, which is nice. This is um, something that the user can set, how, how uh, much the math is enlarged. So this is an example of using MathML to uh, make math easier to see for somebody who's got a visual impairment. If you um, right-click on it, Steve mentioned this, and I'll show it to you now, Math Player Settings. Um, this is a user configurable, user configurable thing um, that may answer some questions that have been coming up 
Um, users can choose if they want the speech generated for somebody um, who's blind, low vision, or with learning disabilities. Um, there are language selections. And Steve mentioned speech styles. They can be selected here. And um, some other configurations, as well as the Braille math code that can be uh, rendered in different, different Braille languages, essentially, Nemeth being one of them. All right. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing my desktop. Go back to the slides. Um, some of you may be familiar <clears throat> with MathJax, which is another way of displaying math. Um, MathJax, very simply, um, it's a complicated thing, but the simple explanation about MathJax is that it's a JavaScript library that can be used to render math in any browser. So even if you have a browser that doesn't support native MathML, you can use MathJax to display MathML. The nice thing about MathJax is that um, all equations look the same in every browser. You don't get any differences in how it's rendered. And MathML can also be used to, uh, as with um, math player sort of hold hands with um, a, a Windows screen reader and read the math aloud. Uh, and it also provides some visual uh, accessibility support, scaling, and zooming. Um, to save time, I'm not going to show you that right now, um, but if you go to mathjax.org, um, you can learn about MathJax. Um, to do a very basic implementation is very easy, and there are instructions on their website for doing that. Um, and I will leave it at that for the time being. Um, when it comes to screen readers, um, this is always a big question. What screen readers will read MathML and what screen readers won't? Here's the basic picture. Um, while MathML can be displayed in a lot of browsers, not all screen readers will read the MathML in all browsers. For example, um, if you're a Windows user, you can use IE9, not 10, but IE9, in conjunction with MathPlayer to read MathML with um, JAWS, NVDA, and Window Eyes, which are just basically the three most popular screen readers uh, in use on Windows. Um, these same three screen readers can be used to read MathML when um, you're using IE9 along with MathJax. So if an author has coded a page to display math with MathJax, these screen readers will also render the math. So that's good. Um, if you're a, a fan of Chrome and you like to use ChromeVox, um, ChromeVox will also render the math out loud um, on Mac or Windows, either using MathJax or native MathML. But as um, I showed you, let me share my desktop. If I switch over to Chrome, Windows. quiet. Um, this is how Chrome visually renders native MathML. So you can see this equation on the screen. It just says minus B plus or minus B2 minus 4AC2A. It doesn't really mean anything. But um, because this is MathML, Chrome, which is reading from the code, will actually render it. Uh, I'm sorry, ChromeVox will actually render it properly, and it sounds like this. Minus B plus minus square root of B squared minus 4AC divided by 2A math. Well, that's ChromeVox reading the MathML, but we don't see the MathML. Instead, if we look at the same equation in MathJax, this is what we see. So this is the same equation, MathML rendered by MathJax, and Chrome will read that as well. Minus B plus minus plus. square root of B squared minus 4AC divided by 2A math. I'm sorry, that was ChromeVox reading within Chrome. ChromeVox only uh, works with Chrome. Um, it does not, it's not a screen reader that can be used with other applications. So let me go back. Again, we're moving kind of quickly, so these are just going to be brief demos. Um, MathML and screen readers, um, some combinations that don't play well right now are JAWS and Window Eyes and NVDA with Firefox or Chrome um, or Internet Explorer when MathPlayer is not installed. In other words, in order for IE to display MathML, you need MathPlayer um, or you need the page um, coded with MathJax. 
but if you want to use a screen reader, you will need Math Player in all of the options that it gives you. Uh, and lastly, VoiceOver right now does not read MathML uh, with any browser. Um, I'm pretty confident that that's going to be changing pretty soon, though. So the options for uh, hearing math uh, read aloud, MathML read aloud, are going to be increasing uh, in the relatively near future. Moving along. Um, another way that you can uh, display and read MathML is um, using iBooks, textbooks. Um, iBooks textbooks can be uh, displayed or used only on iPads right now. They can only be created with iBooks Author, which is um, an application that runs on the Mac. It's free. Um, iBooks Author will create textbooks with all sorts of interactivity embedded in them, and um, they will also render MathML. Uh, and I will show you a quick example of that. I share my desktop and go. This will be... Um, this is a movie of um, VoiceOver, the iOS and OS X screen reader, reading um, math from within uh, an iBooks textbook. And this will, the audio will be a little bit quiet, so you might want to turn up the volume on your uh, speakers or headsets. Here we go. Fraction start, minus, B plus or minus, square root of B to the 2 minus, 4, A, C, over 2, A, and a fraction. So um, the, the, the oral rendering of this MathML was a little different than what we heard from Chromebooks and what we might hear from JAWS reading in conjunction with MathPlayer. For example, um, instead of saying divided by 2A, um, VoiceOver says over 2A um, to indicate the fraction. That's, um, that's a difference in the rendering engine. Um, that's not something that you code into MathML. All right. Go back. And then um, digital talking books, or DTBs, I know are uh, of interest to many people on the call. Um, digital talking books are um, books that um, have been marked up using um, another markup language, a special markup language, that allows um, the user to navigate in a very structured manner through a book, um, uh, hearing the book read aloud, but you can also um, navigate through the book in a variety of ways, from chapter to chapter, heading to heading, paragraph to paragraph. Um, they're extremely useful um, for uh, blind or visually impaired people. And um, some DTB readers, software and hardware, will also uh, render MathML. Um, in a DTB, you can um, include images, because some DTBs can also be displayed visually, and if you use images of math, then obviously you'll want to use, say, alt text or long description to provide a text equivalent. But you can also include MathML, and at least two DTB software readers will render the MathML visually and read it aloud. One of, them, one of these readers is called Dolphin Easy Reader, which is a Windows device, and one is called Read Here from GH, which is um, software that runs on Windows or Mac. I will give you a short demo of Dolphin here. Okay, okay this is um, on the screen. You see Dolphin Easy Reader. It's a software reader. There is on the screen there is a yellow box highlighting a sentence, and below that there is our friend the quadratic formula. Uh, I'm going to uh, Turn on uh, the speech feature of Easy Reader, and you'll hear it read the sentence, and then you'll hear it read the equation. Here we go. Here is what it looks like. Fraction minus B plus minus square root of B squared minus 4 I C N root over to our N fraction. Now, again, um, you get a different oral rendering. Um, uh, this rendering may not be clear enough for some users uh, because it doesn't necessarily differentiate for a C. It speaks it for a C. It said over to a. Um, this, this is the way that this device renders it. This is something that I'm sure can be changed, but I wanted just to show you that there are different ways that MathML will be rendered by different devices. Okay, moving along. Those are some examples of um, tools and applications that you can use to um, see and hear math read aloud, but what about creating them? Let me just spend a couple of minutes 
we're talking about that. Actually, four minutes. Here we go. Um, you can author MathML in a variety of ways. Um, if you like to have fun and have a lot of time on your hands, you can just do it by hand with a text editor. Um, it's just an XML language, and if you're familiar with how that works, away you go. But most people will use um, an authoring tool like MathType, which um, comes from design science just like MathPlayer and some other tools. MathType is a plug-in for applications like Word or InDesign or iBooks Author that will allow you to insert a MathML equation or an equation in another form directly into your document. Um, FireMath is a Firefox add-on that allows you to create the equation in the browser, and then you can simply copy and paste that equation into, um, into whatever application you're using for authoring, which can be iBooks Author, it can be Word, InDesign, anything else. Um, that's free. If you just Google FireMath, you can plug that right into Firefox. Um, as I said, you can copy MathML from MathType or FireMath or other applications and paste it directly into other documents. HTML, uh, the nice thing about HTML5, among many things, is that you can just stick the math markup right into the document without declaring a new namespace or anything. Just stick it right in and away you go. EPUB, you can put it into digital talking books and many other formats. Um, something I wanted to mention was a tool that is being developed by GH, uh, the company that makes Read Here, I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, in conjunction with the Diagram Project, they're working on a toolbar called Waves, which allows you to create and edit and import and export MathML, and you can create entire equations from just the keyboard um, or a mouse, but if you're a keyboard lover, you'll be able to do it all from the keyboard. And the nice thing about it is that you can hear the equations spoken aloud as they're created, so you'll be able to hear it hear the math without rendering it in, uh, in a, another device first, which is very useful for authoring. Um, MathML can be included in DTBs using um, a tool called MathDaisy, which is a plug-in for Word for Windows. Um, if you use it in conjunction with another tool called Save as Daisy, which is a free plug-in uh, in MathType, you can literally use MathType to write the equation into the Word document. And then you'll have an export option to turn that whole thing into a DTB that will include MathML. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I won't be able to show you that today, but these are things that you'll be able to find online very easily. Uh, and then finally, um, I wanted to mention uh, a tool called Poet, which is a tool from the Diagram Center that can be used to write image descriptions um, for DTBs, but you can also use it to write uh, to uh, write MathML using a tool called Math Helper, which is part of the whole POET operation. Um, it's a function that converts another math language called ASCII math into MathML. So you're not actually writing MathML, but you are writing math um, in one language, and Math Helper will then convert it into MathML, which can be used in the DTB. Um, just a quick slide of some resources, some things to consider um, uh, following up from this presentation, um, looking at information at the W3C. If you go to their um, math activity, if you go to w3.org slash math, uh, a whole world of specifications will open up for you. Design science, makers of math type and math player and math data and other tools. We've mentioned fire math. Um, and Steve Noble has written a very good article about technology and um, making math accessible in various ways, which is available on the Design Science site as well, uh, which is highly recommended reading. Uh, and with that, with a great gasp, um, we'll take questions. Well, questions. Okay, I will say uh, at the top here, we're um, coming up close to the hour. Continue to write your questions even as we go past. Um, yes, this is being recorded. It will be available on the diagram website. Um, in a few days, and uh, if you continue to write your questions, we'll stay here, and they'll all be answered, if, even if we have to put them on the website and or email them out to the list of attendants here. So I'm going to go way back to the beginning, where we started to have questions that were coming in for our presenters. Uh, the first is, does the developer need to define the speech styles, or is that done on the user end? Uh, and I think it might be important to say that uh, everything that Jeff 
demoed, all of those different uh, text-to-speech engines read the same bit of MathML. So you s both saw visually and heard uh, different styles of seeing and hearing the same exact MathML code. So in the development in the uh, of the um, of the math document, the MathML is the same, uh, and then it, and then it goes out to the reader or the user or the student, um, and it's what's that interface? What is, what technology are they using to access the math? And that's going to give them uh, the different styles. And that can that can either be set by the user. If you're in an academic setting, it may be set by a teacher. It may be set as part of an assessment. Uh, it may also, you may be in a proprietary reading situation where the development of the content and the development of the text-to-speech or the rendering system may all be done uh, by one or, you know, by, by the same uh, organization or for the same uh, pedagogical purposes. So it's, it's confusing, but uh, suffice it to say that one snippet, one, the same FML can be rendered many, many, many different ways. So it can be a user setting, um, but not necessarily depending on the situation. Uh, another one. This math, yes, it works in IE. Um, do you propose that students and or staff learn MathML? I'll ask Steve to back me up on this one, but really students wouldn't need to use MathML um, because that's behind the scenes, under the hood, uh, so to speak. If you're talking about a college or university DSS office, then you would need your people working in there to understand both the math content and the MathML to ensure. They might not necessarily need to code MathML because they'll use a tool to do that, um, but they'll need to know that it is being uh, produced properly and reading correctly. Steve, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, yeah, I would. I would just say that uh, generally speaking, yeah, you don't. You don't need to know uh, about the inner workings, inner workings of MathML. I mean, uh, people use uh, editors. You know that uh, are generally or what you see is what you get type editors, and uh, and it does the. MathML uh, conversion, as you know, for you, you, you don't really need to know what's going on uh, underneath. Thank you. Uh, another question about speech styles. Do developers need to reference the speech styles they want to include? Um, no, that's really a, a content issue, or if you're look, talking about uh, education, it's a pedagogical issue. And uh, I'll ask if Steve has anything else to say about that in terms of developers needing to know how it's yeah. the math and else going to be rendered on the other end. Yeah, it depends on what they mean by developer. If the if you're talking about the the peop, someone who is creating the content, um, uh, no, there there's uh, nothing different that the content creator uh, has to do. If you're talking about whoever is uh, implementing the uh, the technology on the user end, uh, then uh, they they there are preset collections of, of speech rules that you can use. Now, if if uh, if you are wanting to create your own set of speech rules to match with a particular, um, let's say, kind of uh, of, a, of a state guideline for reading math, something like that, then uh, then the the you know the state could actually create those rules uh, and uh, and then implement them at the state level. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the, if they're talking about that kind of developer, yes. Uh -huh. Thanks. We've hit the top of the hour, and some people are dropping off, but we'll stay on for another five minutes and keep going. Again, all of these uh, answers will be uh, captured and sent, sent out to everybody uh, afterwards. Uh, another question related uh, is why does math need to be converted for students with learning disabilities? Uh, and I'll... I'll ask that one of Steve, I think, mm -hmm. also. Oh, sure. So we, uh, so in our uh, in our metric study that we did uh, with with students, uh, this was uh, this was funded through. It was part of the uh, Mathematics Etext research study. Uh, there were several different research strands. One was in Kentucky, and so we we actually did uh, studies with students who had learning disabilities. And uh, we first of all we just had them read math with 
you know, visually, and uh, and you'd be surprised how badly they are able to actually read mathematics and uh, and, and actually correctly verbalize uh, what they were seeing, and that is the first step to understanding. So if you can actually verbalize correctly that what you are seeing, then the the next step of actually understanding the math is uh, is problematic. So. So uh, what we have found is that when the software actually verbalizes the math for these students, their ability to comprehend the mathematics goes up significantly, and uh, the, that was the, also also the results of our SMART study, the one we did before our metric research stand. Both of those uh, actually did help support that conclusion, and we have uh, there's a, there's a, a few articles we have published uh, on those research findings. And uh, be happy to share those through the uh, through the website. Okay. Thanks, Steve. I think we'll go to one more uh, question. This is more of a uh, general question. There's lots of specific, a lot of specific technical and software questions, which we'll answer uh, all of. But we're not going to be able to get to it by the end of the session today. But here, this will be the last question uh, while we're all on the phone here uh, or using audio. How would you use a MathML author to make equations in existing digital textbooks uh, accessible? And the simple answer is you can't. You need to make a new document, but I'll turn it over to Jeff. For yeah, um, um, if, if you have a textbook that has images of math in it, then you would need to have access to the source, to the source code, to either add text alternatives or descriptions um, of the images of math, or you would need to use an authoring tool, such as the ones that we've shown briefly here, um, to recreate those equations as MathML, and then the MathML would be rendered by the user, uh, by the user agent. So there's no way to say scan an image and turn it into MathML, as far as I know, unless Steve knows of something. Um, you got to have humans involved in the conversion of existing um, equations to MathML or into accessible images of math. Yeah, there there is a there is one uh, OCR tool uh, that isn't um, it is useful in some settings uh, called Infty Reader I N N I N F T Y Reader R E A D E R which uh, will which will do uh, scan and convert uh, uh, text uh, into into MathML as one of its output options. However, it's uh, it has a high error rate, so it uh, there's a lot of cleanup that has to be done, uh, so much so that uh, if you're using uh, a typical textbook format with, with lots of uh, images and inset text and, um, uh, you know, uh, bars on the right side, you know, uh, it, it doesn't work very well in that, that kind of setting. If it's simple uh, black text on white page, uh, it, it works pretty well. Well, this Thank is you, Julie Noblet. Oh. Sorry, Julie. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. This is Julie Noblet again at Diagram, and uh, this does uh, bring us to the end of our hour. I want to, I'm sure, join everyone on the call in thanking the three of you for a fantastic presentation, really informative. There were some questions we couldn't get to. What we're going to do is post the questions and the answers. Uh, actually, probably all the questions and answers on a um, Word document that we'll post on the Diagram website, along with the slides and a closed caption recording of today's session. So you can get to all of these links and share the link with others that you think might be interested. So thank you very much for attending today and for your patience with our uh, late start. And um, we hope to see you next time. We do these uh, webinars quarterly. So uh, please join us again, and thank you.